Jacksonville and St. Bonaventure, the two combatants in the Eastern Championship, were newcomers to the final round of four. Both boasted impressive 26 and one records, but there was one major difference in their credentials. Jacksonville was at full strength, while St. Bonaventure without Bob Lanier, its injured All-American, could only be considered a lame duck. At the outset, the Bonnies Matt Gant, number 35, took the play away from the taller Dolphins. Normally a corner man, Gant was moved into the middle to replace Lanier. At 6-5, he surrendered seven inches to Jacksonville's Artis Gilmore. Right, now let's get on the board. Let's get on the Nevertheless, Gant dominated play at both ends of the court. Scoring 10 points in six minutes, Gant inspired visions of an upset. All right, all right, look, we want to get you the ball, but you play away from Rick for a little bit. All right, and then that'll mean that Pembrook, Pembroke, we're going to let you flash up in the high post. You're playing on Rex's side. Okay. All right. Now, Chipper, then you'll be looking to get the ball to Art some in there. Look inside to Art or Pim to feed the ball, penetrate with the ball, or get it back out to Weddington. See, there's no pressure at all. But on defense, let's play some defense, and we don't have, we're not getting any board. Okay. All right. Let's score the low part. It was the guards who kept the Dolphins in the game. Rex Morgan and 5'10 playmaker Vaughn Wedeking carried the team. Gilmore closed in on Gant. And Wedeking gave Jacksonville its first lead. They don't have a big man in there. He's first on the board. He wants to fight. Look. All right, look. I want Bond to either get the good little soft jump shot in close, or else we're going to penetrate, or you flash in the middle, get the ball and take it down inside and penetrate. All right, we got to get the ball into Art if we can a little bit more. And now, Art, when you come out to block the shot and take your man, you've also got to get back in the board. Right, Art, you got to do it for us, baby. We'll gradually get the ball to you more, but until we do, you got to take up the slack and get it on the, all the board. For the remainder of the half, Artis Gilmore proved too tall for the Bonnies. He missed only one shot from the field as Jacksonville swept to an eight-point halftime advantage. It's a shame that my son, uh, uh, Bob Lanier, is not here tonight uh, because I know it will be a, a altogether different game. And he had said because of this being his last year, he, w he would like for his team to be number one in the country. And I, I can almost bet you that it would have been if he had been here. Dolphin publicity referred to Rex Morgan and Artis Gilmore as the dynamic duo. And for the first 10 minutes of the second half, they were exactly that. Gilmore won the battle of the board and poured in 12 quick points. The Bonnies, out of desperation, were picking up fouls at an alarming rate. fouled out with 10 minutes remaining. He had scored 14 points, but just two in the second half. Without Gant, the Bonnies appeared defenseless, and it seemed the Dolphins could name the score. Come on, Billy! But suddenly, St. Bonaventure thrust itself back into contention. Co-captain Bill Cowbaugh, who didn't score a field goal in the first half, hit four in two minutes, and the momentum swung back to the Bonnies. If there was a pivotal play, this was it. A turnover, 
a fast break, a layup by Paul Hoffman, but a whistle on the play. Watch it again. You'll see Hoffman called for charging Chip Dublin. The basket counted. But instead of trailing by just four points, the Bonnies fell back by six when Dublin hit one and one. Their charge had been blunted. Mike Cull became the fourth Bonnie to be whistled off the court. In the final analysis, this was the story of the game. The Dolphins, outshot from the floor, made 37 free throws to just 15 for St. Bonaventure. Jacksonville had not played its best game, but for coach Joe Williams, this was unimportant because the Dolphins had won. There's a whole new way of living that they help supply the drive. It's got a lot to give to those who like to live, cause Pepsi helps them come alive. Pepsi generation coming at you, going strong. Put yourself behind a Pepsi if you're living. Western final matched UCLA, seeking an unprecedented fourth consecutive national championship against New Mexico State. The two previous years, UCLA eliminated the Aggies in regional play. The Aggies' big man, Sam Lacey, number 44, used his 6'10", 235-pound frame to muscle his way to a pair of early baskets. But Lacey suffered an ankle injury, which virtually rendered him hors de combat. UCLA, a disciplined, balanced team worked for good shots. Steve Patterson and Sidney Wicks drove for sure baskets. The 6'8 Wicks owned the backboards. At both ends of the court. Wicks again. Curtis Rowe exemplified the emphasis placed on defense by coach John Wooden. Sidney Wicks transformed it into two points. The Aggies were cold from the floor, shooting 37%. In contrast, UCLA was hitting an amazing 58%. The Bruins scoring was shared almost equally among the five starters. The Aggies replacement, Jimmy Collins. Collins, number 22. And UCLA's Henry Bibby waged a shootout for the remainder of the half. State closed the gap to seven points 
in a half in which not one Aggie was credited with an assist. Early in the second half, with Sidney Wicks rebounding, John Ballaly spearheading a furious pass break, and Henry Bibby's outside sniping, UCLA roared to a 19-point ball. Lacey was limited to eight points, far below his season average. Five-eight Charlie Chris, the smallest man in the tournament, hit 19 points. He was the Aggies' second leading scorer. Oh, the Bruins with 23, followed closely by Wicks with 22. But the significant factor about the U-Clans was their balance, with all starters scoring in double figures. In Jimmy Collins, the Aggies had the best one-on-one -on -one shooter in the tournament. The 6-2 Collins topped all scorers with 28 points. He won a spot on the all-tournament team. Collins' individual excellence wasn't enough, and in the end, UCLA had won its 23rd consecutive tournament game. <laughs> Happiness is victory, all right, all right. and a mother's pride. Out here? Yeah. Wait, right here? Three. Right. Coach Lou Henson summarizes the Aggie defeat. Last year we played UCLA, they had the big man, Lou Alcindor, and so this year we felt we had a better chance of beating them. But after Thursday evening's ball game, we found out they not only had one big man, they had five. They used balance, speed, and quickness to defeat us handily. The 1970 All-America team was unique in that not one player reached the national championship. An injury prevented Bob Lanier from participating, but nothing could detract from his season-long brilliance. The 6'11 center developed a deft outside touch. In the past year, year and a half, I've had to change my style of play a little bit more. I've had to come outside and get off the 15 to 20 foot shot to like balance things off a little bit more. Bob Lanier, the best big man in the country. In the backcourt, Purdue's Rick Mount for the second year in a row. Mount holds every Big Ten single game, season, and career scoring record. He did it with a phenomenal jump shot. Mostly, my jump shot comes from my wrist and my fingertips. This brings about a high arc and, it, and a softer touch when it hits the rim. The sharpest shooter in college basketball, Rick Mount. Dan Issel led Kentucky to the Southeastern Conference Championship. While so doing, he averaged 34 points per game. We asked Dan how he did it. The fast break at the University of Kentucky has helped me to free myself for a, a pass from the outside and in this way get the easy layup. Dan Issel, the country's top front court scorer. 
Niagara's Calvin Murphy proved again that there is a place for the little man in basketball. Just 5'10", Murphy averaged better than 30 points per game for the third consecutive season. The nation's sixth leading scorer, the little man with the big shot, Calvin Murphy. Pete Maravich from Louisiana State is the player of the year. 1970 saw Maravich become college basketball's all-time scoring leader. To do this, he had to beat every defense. There have been many defenses that have been thrown up against me. This has caused me to have some kind of movement changes, try to free myself so I can do some scoring. The prototype of the new breed of all Americans, Pete Maravich. The national championship matched Jacksonville against defending titleist UCLA. UCLA had ridden the tree-tall frame of Lou Alcindor to the national crown. Now, the situation was different. It was Jacksonville's seven-foot-two-inch giant, Artis Gilmore, number 53, who was controlling the tempo of the game, rebounding and scoring at a racehorse pace. Curtis Rowe fired the Bruins' only retort. Right now, man, look, smoothness on offense is the key. You got to keep coming, take it in the art as often as you can now. Not a bad pass. Each time you take it in the art, we've got to make them try to foul or something, and you guys have got to go to the board. All right, hey, when Art gets that ball, that is, hey, when you feed the ball into Art, you come on around him and let Bond come down to the corner. So you got to get in the boards. Like if he comes out to shoot the jump shot, you got to be in the middle to get the rebound. The U clans were committing frequent, uncharacteristic turnovers. Pembroke Burroughs, the Dolphins' other seven-footer, was connecting from the outside. Oh. Hey, you get you don't get off your man. He's going to block everything. You got to go to the boards when Art gets the ball. Burroughs hit four early baskets. At this point, two things happened. First, UCLA, a strong outside shooting team, began to find the range. Second, the overzealous Dolphins were collecting numerous unnecessary personal fouls. We have to bring a triple in for Rex. <laughs> Mr. Scott, we haven't shot one yet. We haven't shot a foul. Not a foul. With seven minutes left in the half, Sidney Wicks commenced to wrest control of the backboards. This, in turn, triggered the Bruins' devastating fast break. Wicks repeatedly blocked Gilmore's shots, and the Catfoot U-Clans, a precision team, were alert to every opportunity. Uh -oh. 
Gilmore was being boxed out by the shorter width. With Gilmore neutralized, the Dolphins' demise seemed inevitable. Yeah, you get out of Valley. Look, don't let him. Whoever's playing, if his own artist is trying to row, you know, don't let him make that easy pass. But you got to stay with him right out of the half court. Now look, he must get back on defense. Now don't let him get the break on. Don't let him get the break, Vaughn. All the way back to the hole. Right, just keep on, man. Keep on. All right, now let's go, babe. Let's go. Let's play some basketball now. All right, let's go. See when you go and you got to pick us up. Jacksonville coach Joe Williams proved a prophet of doom. The thing he feared most, the UCLA fast break, was death to the Dolphins. Every turnover was turned into a Bruin basket. Mark's going to have to take it on in and make the guy foul. Jacksonville lost not only its poise, but also its scoring touch. The Dolphins failed to make a field goal in the final three minutes of the half. UCLA swept into the lead for the first time on Bibby's basket with 1.16 remaining. With the ubiquitous Sidney Wicks dominating the backboards, the Dolphins were being run into the floor. At the half, it was UCLA by five. In the second half, the leech-like Wicks was still batting the ball back at Gilmore. And picking up points underneath. They're playing a zone. Now let's see what kind of zone it is. Gilmore and Burroughs who combined for 22 points in the first half, were held to seven in the second. Steve Patterson was giving Wicks a strong hand on the board, while also contributing 17 points. Continue to plague the Dolphins. Ultimately, this proved their undoing as UCLA outscored them 24 to 7 from the line. Wits, with his constant harassment of Gilmore, forced Jacksonville into repeated errors. Once more, John Wooden's style of play was being executed in textbook fashion. The inability to get the ball into Gilmore was killing the Dolphins. As was the outside shooting of the tournament's outstanding player, Sidney Wicks. Jacksonville's guard, Vaughn Wedeking, and Rex Morgan kept the score respectable. Again, the U Clan scoring was distributed among all starters. Curtis Rowe was the leader with 19. Gilmore suffered the ultimate indignity when he fouled out. Now let's go. Now wait just a second. Let's go. Rod, go ahead now. Get on that man and chase him. It was a sad climax to a superb season, but he is young, tall, and talented. And you have not heard the end of Artis Gilmore. The scrappy Dolphins fought to the finish, but they were not a match for the more experienced, 
better balanced Bruin, whose winning strategy is outlined by Captain John Vallely. I think our game plan on defense was to try to front, front Gilmore and uh, have a man behind him try to get the lob pass. Then the guard would sink over into the middle and try to block the pass to the high post. Because once they get to the high post, then they can jump in into Gilmore and get good shots down there. The script has a familiar ring. The Bruins win their fourth straight national crown. John Wooden is coach of the year. And until proven otherwise, UCLA is still number one.